Hello everyone, this is Fedua Mansouri, your teacher of critical media literacy. I'm happy to be with you today. In this lecture, we're going to perform a critical analysis of Rambo, First Blood, the American 1982 film. Well, this analysis is not meant to be comprehensive, meaning we're not going to analyze every aspect of the film. That would be impossible, but just a small set of aspects. But before that, let's take a second look at what we had together so far, namely this amazing skill of critical media literacy, especially as discussed by W. James Potter in his book, Media Literacy, the uh, 2016 edition. As you may remember, uh, he explained that media literacy included three blocks. First, skills. Second, knowledge structures, remember? And then, personal locus. At this stage, I want you to remember that this film is what we call a media message. Media messages are anything that media happen to offer through newspapers, books, video games, talk shows, TV series, blogs, websites, small movies, big movies, and even the small labels on the products that we buy every day are media messages. So we now know that all media want to seduce you into accepting their messages. The question is, should we accept any message that seduces us? Well, what we need to do instead is go beneath the surface, deconstruct the messages, and then decide how to do that. Well, the first step is to go beyond the immediate basic reactions to the media message. You know, we might be impressed, we might be angry, we might be excited, sad, overwhelmed, heartbroken, etc. A whole range of emotional and mental states. When we go beyond that immediate effect of the media message, the next step is to investigate. The investigation has three components. First, looking into the what, meaning the information about the media message, and then examining the how and the why, meaning the critical processing of the what, and then formulating our interpretation and the meaning we make out of the media message. All this is the process of building our knowledge structures, which is the second building block of media literacy. Knowledge structures. Um, the what might include all kinds of facts, messages, information, pictures, videos, etc. So during or after this process of collecting information about the media message, the magic questions about the how and the why come up. And to answer them, we have to use first the first building block of media literacy, which is the seven skills. Remember them? And then the ultimate objective is to draw our conclusions, form our interpretations, and make meaning out of the media message. Let's do um, a small review of the seven skills. There are seven, of course. Analysis, evaluation, grouping, induction, deduction, synthesis, and abstracting. Let's go one by one. Analysis is breaking down a message into meaningful elements. Who, what, when, where, why, and how. Evaluation. It is judging the value of an element. The judgment is made by comparing a message element to one's standards. So either you accept the message or decide to take these elements 
and compare them to your own standards and then decide whether it's good or bad. Grouping. It is determining the similarities and differences between groups elements and applying classification rules. Uh, either you accept the media classification rules and end up seeing the world as they want you to or apply the ones that, that have the best value or the most meaning to you. Induction. It is inferring a pattern across a small set of elements, then generalizing the pattern to all elements in the set. Be careful though. Induction is not good if it is used to judge groups for the behavior of individuals. I'm sure this reminds you of something you did or went through at some point in your life. Induction is good, on the other hand, if you use it to identify a pattern in evidence and then test it with more evidence. Deduction. It is using general principles to explain particulars. A famous example is Socrates' syllogistic reasoning. I'm sure you know it. All men are moral. This is the general principle. Socrates is a man. This is a particular observation. Therefore, Socrates is moral. This is the conclusion reached through logical reasoning. Again, be careful. Examine your own general principles. Because if they are accurate, you are more likely to draw more accurate uh, conclusions. Synthesis. It is assembling elements into a new structure. It is used, for example, to integrate all the divergent and different and contrasting arguments about an issue and formulate your own opinion. Abstracting. It is creating a brief, clear and accurate description capturing the essence of a message in a smaller number of words than the message itself. One of its uses uh, is when you need to express your opinion, your position briefly about an issue. Uh, one of its uses too is to write an abstract for your dissertation. Well, the third building block is personal locus. It is your drive or motivation as you try to, to interpret media messages. I guess Yours now might be one of two. Either you care about not being fooled anymore about the media, which is a good motivation, or maybe you care only about passing this module. And both are fine with me. At this point and before we engage in analysis, I'd like first to be clear about something. Rambo First Blood is a great movie and it is great on so many levels. The people involved in creating it are all great artists and the product is of high value. It still has a great legacy right now. Well, now what we're in the middle of is an educational activity and its purpose is learning a critical skill. So just because we critique something doesn't mean denying its value or its quality. We're learning, just learning how to see the not obvious. Let's now get into analysis of Rambo First Blood, the 1982 film. The first step is the unprocessed information about the film. Unprocessed meaning uh, they are merely descriptive, they're not critical. They include what it is, why is it made, for whom it is meant, how it is made. So what it is includes information like the medium type. Here 
it's not a newspaper, it's not a TV series, it's a film. So the medium type is cinema. The genre, le genre, this is a French word. It concerns what it is in terms of, for example, it's not a romance, is it? It's not a horror movie, is it? It's an action thriller. This is the type. The plot is the storyline. We're going to see the plot later on. So why it is made is about the purpose. As we're not critiquing yet, so we're going to talk about the purpose that is declared by the producer, for example. For whom it is meant is about the, the audience. I guess here it's not a specific audience, it's not a limited audience, it's the whole world, okay? We are Algerians looking into this movie. This is the proof that it is meant for the whole world. Um, how it is made? This is about the cinematographic craft. Uh, the people who made it, the decisions they took, the language they chose, and the crafts codes that they chose and used to convey the message. The next step is to investigate what's happening in the environment, not in the movie, outside of the movie, the context. The context might be historical, ideological, social, the reception of the movie itself, the reactions. So let's now uh, get into the film and let's start with the credits, the product, the actors, the director, etc. So the plot sources, uh, of course, it's better to watch it, but you, if you can't watch the movie or you can't find it, you can read about it. You can read the plot summaries and synopses on the net, for example, Wikipedia, uh, IMDB, fandom.com, okay? All of these are, and others, of course, are good sources um, for the plot now well the setting is the time and place of the story the story took place in 1980 in hope the town of hope in Washington state only this town is fictional it doesn't exist the movie was filmed in a Canadian town of the same name in British Columbia you can see the you see the red paint on the on the map there, that is the real hope town in British Columbia. It's near Vancouver. Okay, so the sets of the movie are, uh, of course, the small town of Hope and the nearby mountains and the woods, of course. So let's get to the plot now. The film opens with John Rambo a former Grand Beret decorated with the Medal of Honor by the U.S. government. Here he tracks down the residence of Delmar Barry, the final member of his unit, who served with him in the Vietnam War, and uh, learns from Mrs. Barry here that he has died many months earlier from cancer due to chemicals used by the U.S. Army. He now knows that he is the last one of his unit. Uh, all his brothers in arms are dead. So if you don't know how um, Green Beret looks like, I have put a picture in here. You have 
three berets, green berets in here. So this is what they look like. Um, so deeply saddened, Rambo enters the town of Hope looking for something to eat and probably a place to spend the night. And on his way, he attracts the attention of the town's sheriff, uh, Will Teasel. And here comes the conflict. So Rambo is brutalized and harassed by the officers of the station, giving him flashbacks to being tortured in Vietnam. He loses control and fights his way out of the police station. He steals a civilian's motorcycle and heads to the nearby mountains, chased by Teasel and later on by the deputies. And he's dragged down into the wilderness. Finds some wire and an old sheet of canvas and makes a tunic for himself to protect his body from the cold. Then starts an intense manhunt throughout the wilderness. It results in Sheriff's Deputy Gold getting killed as he tries to kill Rambo in cold blood. Rambo tries to turn himself in because it was self-defense, but Diesel prefers revenge. John Rambo finds himself entangled in a new war, this time in his own home country with his own fellow citizens as the enemy. Then the situation gets out of hand with the whole town chasing Rambo who lives off the land as drained. U.S. Special Forces Colonel Sam Trotman, Rambo's former commanding officer back in Vietnam, arrives taking credit for training Rambo and telling the sheriff that Rambo has been trained to survive in harsh environments and trained to kill. He recommends that they should prepare for the worst because they don't simply don't stand a chance. Rambo eventually turns from defense to offense and gets himself heavily armed by hijacking a passing truck in National Guard caravan. He returns to town at nightfall. He turns the town into a war zone, like you see in the pictures, then heads up to the police station where Diesel is. Diesel fires at Rambo, who returns fire and seriously injures the sheriff. Then Colonel Crotman appears and tells Rambo that he is surrounded and that he has to turn himself in. Rambo rages about the horrors of the Vietnam War, a war that he had not chosen, but fought and became a hero only to come back and be treated as a criminal. These are more pictures of the war zone that he created in the town. Rambo sobs into Trotman's shoulder, emotionally drained, he turns himself in and is arrested. The credits roll as he and Colonel Trotman leave the police station gazing with disdain as Teasel, who is transported by the ambulance. Look, if you felt any emotion, now is the time to go beyond it. Now let's ask our little questions. So our first question is, what was actually happening during the time of this movie? I mean, what's the political and the social context taking place then? So 
I wanted to focus on four contextual features. First, the US failure in Vietnam. Second, Roland Reagan presidency. Three, Vietnam syndrome and the feminist movements. So, let's start with the US failure in Vietnam. The US were involved in Vietnam War to prevent communism from spreading, obviously. They were unable to defeat the Viet Cong because of many reasons. Some of them were their unadapted military tactics to the Vietnamese, unpredictable guerrilla tactics operating with no actual front lines. The American army bombed and used chemical uh, weapons causing massacres of innocent civilians, striking a hard head to the American moral image and even to the justification itself of the war not only among American people and Congress, but in the war field as well. The American government thus withdrew the forces in 1973 and the conflict ended in 1975. So the resulting Vietnam syndrome is how the American politicians called the American people's reluctance meaning refusal to support military interventions abroad. This reluctance is caused by the people's feelings of guilt about the ravages caused by the Vietnam War and their state of uncertainty about the morality and ethicality of America's um, motives and actions during the war. Ronald Reagan had a conservative sort of right-wing politics, you know, the politics that advocate a militaristic and interventionist foreign policy, allegedly uh, aimed at promoting democracy abroad. So in reality, Reagan's support of the US uh, military interventions was motivated by a military rivalry with the Soviet Union. So he urged the American people to overcome the Vietnam syndrome. And uh, as he put it, the feelings of guilt as if we were doing something shameful. He said that in his address to the veterans of foreign wars uh, commission, convention sorry, uh, in Chicago, 1980. And the feminist movements. Well, uh, women were inspired by human rights movements and uh, the anti-Vietnam War protests. This was uh, between the 1960s and the late 1980s. So they actively protested and uh, activated against discrimination and demanded equal pay for equal work uh, equal job opportunities, expanded child care services, and overall gender uh, equality. This was the context. This was or was taking place during the 80s. And this is very important in our critical uh, analysis. Now, let's go to the actual message of the film. So what the film was um, saying. So the film portrayed a war hero betrayed by his own government, uh, the government who abandoned the war, the soldiers did everything to win. The veteran uh, was so used to war that he couldn't uh, fit in into uh, civilian life and he's not welcome in his country, the country he was ready to die for, mistreated that he led him to violence again and he's, as all veterans, haunted by trauma and guilt, uh, what we call now the PTSD. So this is in a nutshell the message uh, of the film. Uh, it was conveyed very well through the, the event of the story from the beginning, but it was summarized in a clearer way uh, in the monologue 
Rambo's famous monologue at the end of the film. Let's have a look. Um, it wasn't my war. You asked me, I didn't ask you. I did what I did to win. So this is uh, one of the very strong sentences said by Rambo. Uh, all this means that uh, this hero is just a means to an end. This is really sad and it is real. It's not just the, the movie. Uh, it's not like our country where the veterans are really taken care of. Uh, American veterans uh, have no future. They fight, then the, if they survive, they are released back into civilian society, unable to fit in, not socially, not financially, not anything. Uh, he said, I can't get it out, out of my head. Of course, the atrocities he saw, uh, this is trauma, and trauma gets treated. He's still dealing with it because it's untreated. The United States did use its soldiers without the appropriate care uh, or support for their psychological state and mental health, not during nor after the wars. Uh, I want you to notice the lighting here. You know, in lighting in cinema, there is the fill lighting and there is the key light. The fill is there to control contrast. But in this picture, there is no fill light. There is no contrast. It's just the light that is directed to the, to the actor and the rest is dark. And this gives you the... Uh, feeling that um, he is in a dark state of mind, a tortured state of mind. And the last element in the list of the things that we said the film is saying is the mistreatment and how it leads the protagonist to violence. And it is clear throughout these scenes, for example, these pictures. Pictures. And I want you to look at Colonel Trotman watching Rambo's breakdown. Look at the shadow over his eyes. Um, what do you think? I think it reflects a bitterness. His bitter consciousness of the fact that the army cannot protect his soldiers. And that the nation's objectives are more important than the individual's. He's conscious that he cannot do anything to help him. Let's go into some critical questions because so far we have been dealing with descriptive questions. Okay, I have chosen three critical questions. Let's go to the first. How did the film address feminist movements? I'm not a feminist, okay? I'm just analyzing. Uh, how was the protagonist can portrayed? Because uh, it's not it's not just a descriptive question. Okay, we'll see how. How was the protagonist who is Rambo portrayed, and why? And how was the failure of the United States in Vietnam tackled? So let's go to the first one. Uh, how did the film address? feminist movements. Well, have you seen any woman in the film other than Mrs. Barry? No. Well, that's how. The interpretation is that the man is defending the nation on his own. Thank you very much. This is called the masculinization of power and patriotism. A funny thing to note, too, is that the actress, the only actress who performed the only female character, is not even listed anywhere in the credits. So, how else did the film address the feminist movements? Well, another indicator of this is that the film's production company is Kurolka Pictures, which is oriented uh, to masculinist uh, ideology, meaning uh, this is its style of sorts, okay? Uh, a masculinist ideology is not that famous because 
uh, feminist ideologies, uh, I think, more uh, vocal. Okay, the, f the masculinist uh, ideology is um, it's doing the thing, okay? It's, it's not saying anything, it's doing, okay? So this production company, uh, do you know what else it produced? Terminator 2, Judgment Day. Can a film be more masculine? The second question, how is the, po the protagonist portrayed and why? It was portrayed as good, as powerful, as mythic and or divine and as unique. So look, Rambo cares about his friends. He is respectful to Mrs. Barry. He even makes a joke to her. He then gives her the photo to keep as a consolation for her loss. Okay? Only this poor actress is not even li listed in the credits. Is it because she's black or a woman? Okay. So Rambo is good willing, uh, his intentions are good, all he wanted is getting something to eat. Well, he is also powerful. Have you seen the muscles? Have you seen the physical power and the fighting skills? They were um, described by Trotman, remember? And he is tough. His personality is strong and he can uh, go through any any hardship uh, eyes closed okay see them the these are two examples uh, you see how his body reminds us of Greek gods okay in the first picture in the second picture you see how he clings to the steep cliff with the sheer strength of his, of his body. Have you noticed him? Okay, so he's powerful. He's tough. These pictures show how tough he, he is. He single-handedly survived the tunnel's darkness and the hungry rats in the tunnel and look at him stitching up his open wound. Look at how mythic and divine he is. The fall from the cliff resulted in a cut on Rambo's upper arm. No more than that. But Stallone, on the other hand, broke three ribs, by the way. Look at this. This is interesting. Uh, look at the body poster along with the tunic in the first picture. Don't you think they suggest Jesus Christ? And we know that Christians believe in Jesus as their God. The second picture shows a redder than red blood, suggesting a different kind of blood than the rest of us. Okay. Next, he's unique. Look at the pictures. He's the only competent and brave character in the film. All the rest are lacking courage and skills. Even the sheriff who is out for revenge, he's crying in the picture, look at him. He's crying just because he was afraid of dying. So uh, this is the protagonist how it was portrayed. The third question, and it is the most important, is how was the US failure in Vietnam tackled? Rambo's monologue was not just about Rambo as a victim or a hero. It was more importantly about the US war in Vietnam at a political and military level. When he says, 
nothing is over. It just connotates the USA defeat, the American conservatist uh, politicians like Reagan, for example, never accepted that defeat. I guess I meant this one. When he says in his monologue, somebody wouldn't let us win, this too matches Ronald Reagan's discourse concerning the need to overcome the Vietnam syndrome. Because the meaning of this sentence is, if it weren't for the ungrateful population, and the uncommitted Congress, we would have won. So it's not our fault. We could have won, but they wouldn't let us win. So Rambo is the alternative reality that the, the Americans dreamt of. American politicians, particularly. Through Rambo, they created an alternative reality. Rambo is a symbol of a dream, of a fantasy. A compensation for defeat. So the Rambo symbol acted as an alternative reality, a fantasy in which the famous theory of American exceptionalism that politicians, American politicians, most of them actually, believed in. So it gets confirmed with this symbol. The idea of the most powerful nation on earth gets emphasized. And the tempting illusion that they did not get defeated is supposed to become less delusional when you hear Rambo say, somebody wouldn't let us win. So let's go ahead and consider a second aspect of this compensation. The film also offers, through Rambo's alleged innocence and goodness, a moral compensation for the U.S. Army's atrocities inflicted to the Vietnamese population. The bad guys, as shown in the film, are the Viet Cong. Remember the pictures of Rambo getting tortured by the Vietnamese soldiers? And the American citizens also are the bad guys those who do not believe in America's right to win the war, represented here by the sheriff and the deputies. Read Ronald Reagan's speech to the, to the veterans of foreign wars in 1980. Um, it's interesting to see how this ideology operates on the ground. So I guess this um, wraps up a little what I had to say about this movie, well, uh, all right, so thank you for watching. Please post any questions. I will be really happy to answer them. And remember, with media, keep calm and never drop your guard. Except with me. Goodbye.